or to the event dedicated to European defense on behalf of the Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies. We are convening on the eve of important commemorations. Just two years ago, on the morning of the 22nd of March, three coordinated suicide bombings occurred in Brussels. Two of them at the Zaventem airport and one at the Melbeck metro station, not so far from here. Several dozens of innocent people lost their lives and many more were critically injured. This horror is teaching us many political and human lessons. One of them is very relevant to today's discussion. There are policy areas where stronger European unity can be a matter of life and death for our peoples and for our countries. The fight against terrorism is no doubt one of them. Security and defense, which we are here to debate, is certainly another. In opening our discussion, I'd like to share with you three brief thoughts on these important topics. The first thought. Recent strategic developments require that the EU gets serious about creating a strong common defense. By now, the matter seems to me how to do it, not whether to do it. I am stating this knowing that the question is a bit controversial. We had already today's lunch discussion, which has confirmed that it is not easy and there are a lot of different views on the issue. Our neighborhood, be it to the east or to the south, is populated by troubled and often aggressive actors, such as Russia, but also, unfortunately, in these days, Turkey. We have China, the coming superpower, which is spreading its, its uh, economic and strategic influence throughout our continent. At the same time, or our main ally, the United States of America, is a bit tired of foreign interventions and swept by protectionist and isolationist temptations. A strong European Defense Union seems the way to the future. But it is fraught with the dilemmas and difficulties. We need to start discussing them openly, honestly, and seriously. All pros, but also all risks or potential difficulties. The second thought. I would like to make clear that transatlantic alliance remains essential to Europe's security but it needs to be reinvented for the new conditions of the 21st century. Alliances are delicate things that require constant maintenance and adaptation to survive and thrive in a changing world. Let's be honest, more and more we have the impression that our American friends do not quite know what to make of their European commitments. Europe can help them by becoming a strong union that takes responsibility for its defense as opposed to a group of quarrelsome and divided countries. In this way, we will be able to protect our own interests and we will show to our allies that we are really responsible, reliable and also strategic partners. And last remark, we must overcome the increasingly untenable division between Atlanticists and Europeanists in matter of defense. These two opposing camps often 
contribute prejudices rather than real solutions. Atlanticists refuse to even consider the possibility that the EU might benefit from developing a strong and autonomous defense. They seem to assume that Europe will be able to outsource responsibility for its defense to the United States until, uh, allow me to say, until the end of our history. Europeanists are prejudicial, preju prejudicially committed to a totally separate EU defense, often with a certain indifferences, if not hostility, to the transatlantic alliance. I feel that both extremes should be avoided. Good arguments on both sides should be discussed in our quest for the security and defense arrangements that will best protect Europe in the next decades. The ambition of our institution, the Martin Center, in its work on European defense is precisely to avoid both extremes and to act as a hub of innovative ideas. Professor Jolion Howard, a renewed scholar who has explored this field for decades, contributed an interesting first plan for an ambitious European Defense Union. We couldn't have hoped for a more authoritative expert, and I'd like to thank him publicly for his precious work with us. Thank you very much, dear Professor. I'd like to thank also our prestigious dis discussants for being here today. Professor Sven Biskop, another noted EU defense expert, and my good friends, Elmar Brock, he's not yet with us, but I know him, he will be in time at the panel, and Sasha Vondra from the Czech Republic, the former defense minister. And now, I'd like to give a floor to my colleague Federico Ottavio Rejo, the strategic coordinator of our research for a real brief presentation, uh, our activity, uh, our, our initiative, which is constituted by New Martin Center Future of Europe series to which this defense paper belongs. Thank you very much for coming, for joining and uh, Thank you very much for your attention, Federico. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'll be very brief, sorry. You, you probably find it bizarre that we have two introductory speeches for a single event. Um, you are right in thinking so, but the fact of the matter is that we are actually presenting two things today, not a single one. As the president said, we are presenting the paper, the defense paper written by Professor Oward, but we are also presenting the new Martin Center series to which this paper belongs. And my task is to briefly introduce the series. Uh, the name of the series is not very original. It is called Martin Center Future of Europe series. There are many such series uh, in Brussels these days, starting, of course, from the commissions, which, as you all know, is published a series of uh, white papers on the future of Europe. Uh, but I think the name is not original, the content is quite original and I hope interesting. Um, the difference with the Commission series is that the Commission um, uh, papers uh, offer scenarios about the future of Europe. We are advocating a specific vision of the future of Europe, which we believe is the traditional vision of the center-right political family. In fact, when you, when you dig deep into it, uh, the, the tradition of statementship to which we belong, which is uh, initiated by uh, Konrad Adenauer, Robert Schumann, and Alcide de Gasperi, just to name the, the main figures. What, what is it all about? Um, and I think in one sentence, it's about, it's about building a strong political union in Europe based on strict subsidiarity. This is the core idea of the series. Um, I think it's what distinguishes us as EPP, as center-right, from other uh, political families, because uh, if you look at the other pro-European political families, such as the, the socialists and the liberals, they are often in favor of European centralism, centralization at the European level, that center-right has traditionally rejected it. 
Uh, on the other end of the political spectrum, you have uh, populists which tend to defend nationalist position. And the center right, uh, once more, has rejected nationalism. So we, uh, if I can summarize, uh, the, the tradition of the center right rejects both European centralism and uh, nationalism and embraces some form of European federalism, if I may say so. So the, the challenge of the series is to revive this old vision and to explain, to think about what this means in different policy areas and to give concrete advice on, uh, to policymakers on how to pursue uh, this vision in different policy areas. What does the series consist in? There is a, an introductory uh, briefing uh, by myself called for a new Europeanism, which you may find uh, around, I, I, I guess, somewhere. Um, together with the defense paper, and then there are follow-up papers in uh, uh, sectoral papers in different policy areas which try to advocate this vision in the different fields of uh, EU competence somehow. Uh, and you are here today to present one such paper, the first, which is indeed on uh, European defense, but there are more in the pipeline. Uh, we are finalizing a paper on differentiated integration by uh, the former Hungarian defense uh, foreign minister, sorry, uh, Janos Martoni, uh, we are working on uh, uh, immigration and asylum and other areas where the, the, the balance of competence between the national and the European level is very contentious. We have a major paper on subsidiarity planned. So if you like the concept of the series and if you like the discussion that we will today have on defense, please stay tuned because more is coming in different policy areas, but advocating the same basic uh, vision of uh, uh, Europe. I should uh, very briefly conclude to uh, saying that, of course, this, any of this paper, given the complexity of the issues we are dealing with, uh, can only be the beginning of a process of reflection. It cannot be the end of a process of uh, reflection. Today, we are starting a process of reflection on defense, and we could not start it better because, as uh, uh, the President Zurinda said, we have one of the foremost specialists on uh, EU defense. Professor Oworth has been studying this for longer than I lived. 40 years, I believe. Um, uh, he, he has been do doing this in Bath for a long time, then in Yale in the United States, and throughout Europe, uh, he has held many visiting professorship. So I don't want to take uh, further time. Uh, Jolion, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Federico, and thank you, President Jorinda, for the invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I want to take up the challenge which uh, the President just put. Um, we are talking today about a new beginning. We're looking at a potentially quite substantial time frame. I don't want to put a date on the time frame, but we are looking at a world in transition. And if Europe needs a new narrative today, that narrative has to be set in the context of a world of power transition. In 2000, six of the top 10 economies in the world were European. In 2030, none of them will be European, possibly Germany, but let's wait and see. This is a world in transition. It's a world which is being structured by an ever smaller number of ever larger units. And if Europeans, as small nation states, continue to cling to a sovereignty which is largely mythical, or continue to cling to Uncle Sam's apron strings, dare I say, then we are all condemned to hang separately. So I want to see it in that, in that long time frame, and I want to put it as a project which investigates the potentiality for Europe to become a serious actor. Now, there may be many in this room who believe at the outset that Europe shouldn't attempt to be a serious defense actor. And to them, I simply say, well, I hope you will at least listen to what I have to say and we'll see where it goes. Uh, but my starting point is not that Europe has no prospect of ever becoming a serious defense actor or that Europe should not make the attempt. I believe that we should make the attempt and I was asked by the Martin Center to write a paper which essentially tries to ask the question, how would we get there to strategic autonomy? Strategic autonomy is the new buzzword, of course, from the global strategy. 
uh, and either we believe that strategic autonomy is a completely meaningless concept, in which, we, in which case we may as well all go home and do something else, or we believe that strategic autonomy uh, is something worth pursuing. Now, back in the dark days after the San Malo summit in 1998, there was a joke going around, which some of you may have heard, but I'll update the joke. It is a joke, and it is a conversation between Jens Stoltenberg and Federica Mogherini with God. They decided that they both needed to consult God about the prospect. So Jens Stoltenberg goes first and says, God, do you, they get the telephone number from Henry Kissinger, of course. Uh, do, you, uh, do you believe that NATO will overcome its problems of uh, its three interventions in Kosovo, Afghanistan and Libya and get its act together and become a really serious transatlantic actor? And God says, yes, Jens, but not in your lifetime. Federica goes next and says, God, do you think that the European Union will ever achieve strategic autonomy? And God says, yes, Federica, but not in my lifetime. <laughs> if you believe that it won't happen in his lifetime, then, uh, you know, this is all a lot of words. I want to begin by saying that um, I myself have worked on this for a very long time and I've, you know, been up and down with it and whatnot. And now it's back again. And one of the things which strikes me most clearly here is the sort of absence of institutional memory in this city. Uh, Elmer Brock, of course, is a good instance of somebody who has masses of institutional memory. But when I read uh, many of the papers that are coming out and the statements and the procl proclamations and whatnot, I think, oh, my God, you know, we heard all this before in 1998, in 2000. It was all, you know, we were reinventing the wheel constantly. And there is a danger there. And I want to put us on guard against the danger of seeing this new momentum which has been sort of bubbling up ever, ever since 2016 and the global strategy and then, of course, uh, you know, the geostrategic events in the south, in the east, with ISIS, with uh, terrorism, with the migrant crisis, with Brexit, with Trump, with, uh, you know, it's all there. Everything is pushing in the same direction that we should uh, begin to get serious about this thing. But we need to be aware that the problems which essentially, in my view, and I hate to have to say this, uh, led to CSDP, that acronymic thing that we all talk about, uh, running into the sand sometime in the early 2010s. Uh, Libya was the defining moment when a crisis emerges for which a scenario for which precisely CSDP was invented and yet it was never even uh, imagined for a second that Europe could do Libya on its own. Beware, I think, of feeling that all of those obstacles have been overcome. They haven't, and particularly the big one, which is the massive difference in level of ambition between the different member states, and the fact that, as we say uh, in French, tout pays, this is visage de la blache, tout pays à l'histoire de sa géographie, meaning that if you happen to be on the Russian border, you have a different view of the world than if you happen to live in Portugal. So we have a problem there. And we need to understand and really think about the lessons of why CSDP in its first incarnation from 2000 to 2015 didn't work. Second point I want to make is that we need to start here with a clear view of what it is we're trying to achieve. We need strategic vision. We need a grand strategy. We need to ask the question, what is it that Europe can realistically expect to achieve with the means at its disposal. Grand strategy I always define as the calculated relationship between means and large ends. And Europe doesn't tend to think in terms of large ends. So we need to do that. We need to get that very clear before we start. Now, I think in terms of means, we have masses in the European Union. We are richer than the United States, infinitely richer than Russia. We have all of the assets and resources that the Americans have, essentially, in this continent. The GDP is bigger. The population is bigger. Uh, there are all sorts of things which Europe has, which it doesn't have to be uh, apologizing for. We are, effectively, the biggest market in the world. Europe has got everything going for it. So we should not hide our light under a bushel. And in relation to Russia, which is, I think, a declining power, almost every policy area and every asset and resource is vastly superior in Europe. So we're not in a bad position. 
but we need to be very clear about what it is we're trying to achieve. And I think there, uh, in terms of means, I would put three, I put four proposals in the paper. I think we have to Europeanize defense spending. I don't honestly believe we need to spend more than 220 billion euros to achieve what it is we're trying to achieve, which is the stabilization of the neighborhood or of the, of the two neighborhoods, east and south. But we need to spend that money strategically. And that doesn't just mean sort of, you know, semester oversights or a little bit of cooperation here and there. It means Europeanizing the budget. Now, I repeat, I'm talking in the long term. This is not going to happen tomorrow. I repeat, we need to put our objectives front and center and say, this is what we are aiming to achieve. We have to see what it is we want to achieve, and then we'll talk about how we get there. But if we're not clear about what it is we're trying to achieve, we'll never get there. Second thing, Europeanization of the, of, of the, um, of the uh, defense spending. I think we need an institutional jiggle. It's not the answer to play around with institutions, but I think that the high representative post is massively overextended and that we need a European security advisor rather like the American national security advisor, which is a post which functions exclusively and focuses exclusively on defense and doesn't try to you know, run the whole world. I'm sorry to say this to a lot of people, but I think we have to grasp the nettle of whether or not Europe is going to have a nuclear deterrent. I have proposals in the paper about how we might or might not achieve that, but we can't completely evacuate the question. Um, and um, finally, I think we have to think about new legal arrangements which would allow us more effectively to cooperate with regional partners. One of the mistakes, I believe, as somebody who has really studied this very carefully, when we set up CSDP and put an end to the WEU, is that we said to Turkey and Norway, well, sorry guys, off you go. We've been talking to you very constructively and productively within the WEU for the last 30 years or so, but now, you know, you're not a member of the EU legally, so we don't really want to, you know, nothing we can do with you anymore. Um, the UK is in the same situation now. I think we need subtle and imaginative and creative legal institutional arrangements which will allow us to maximize the potential of the partnership with those other countries. But above all, and I'm going to end on this because I think it's the most important thing of all, uh, we need to sort out the EU-NATO relationship. Why do we need two separate, distinct security actors if strategic autonomy, as I would understand it, or anybody, I mean, you know, it's not just a semantic question, but if strategic autonomy means anything, it means that the European Union will be able to do things on its own. Well, if it can do it on its own, why does it need NATO? And if it can't do it on its own, if it doesn't reach strategic autonomy, what is the point of CSDP? So um, I, I, I believe that um, the answer really lies in ever greater cooperation, interdigitation, consultation, and indeed merger of the CSDP with NATO. There were very, very sound reasons why it was necessary after uh, the 1990s for the experiment in CSDP to be totally autonomous, for the Europeans to learn what it meant to talk about defense and how they could talk to each other about it. But I think we've gone through that historical period, we're beyond that historical period, and that the answer really now lies in uh, a progressive merging of these activities so that we can maximize them all. And if we listen to the debate in the United States, and it is a debate, it's not a one-sided discourse, a one a unidimensional discourse, there is a debate in the United States, but there is a growing clamor in the United States You've all heard it, not just from Trump, but also from Obama and from Clinton and from George W. Bush and for that from George H. W. Bush. George H. W. Bush opened the NATO summit in Rome in 1991 by looking at the Europeans in the eye and saying, if your purpose is to become autonomous, the time to tell us is now. Because there was a lot of talk of it then. 
and nobody blinked. But the, that agenda was set way back then, and ever since we've been playing around with this. Now, Bush, uh, sorry, uh, what was his name? What's the guy's name? Trump. Talked about obsolescence and whatnot. But Bernie Sanders was saying the same thing. And between Bernie Sanders and Trump, you know, you've got a majority of Americans. Um, the international relations profession in the United States, the realist wing of it, there is another wing which says the opposite thing. But the realist wing, which is still the dominant wing of the American international relations profession, has been saying for quite some time that the Europeans must take responsibility for their neighborhood. And they are coming up increasingly with all sorts of projects to transfer to the Europeans more and more responsibility and indeed leadership within the alliance. Now, this is not a recipe for killing off the transatlantic relationship. I want to emphasize that absolutely front and center. This is not a relationship for breaking up the transatlantic alliance. On the contrary, the message from the Americans, and this goes back to the immediate post-war period, 45, 46, 47, before the European defense com community was invented. The Americans were saying to the Europeans, for God's sake, get your act together. We will take you seriously if you take yourself seriously. The debate about setting up NATO was all about that. Take yourself seriously and we will be good partners. Ever since then, we've had this horrible debate about burden sharing. So it is a question of stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility increasingly so that there can be a rebalancing within the alliance. Now, some people listening to that will say, oh my God, we can't give these Europeans any responsibilities. They're hopeless. And I would agree with them to a large extent. We haven't yet learned what it takes to create the sort of cohesion and the sort of uh, coordination and mindset that President Jorinder was talking about. We're still caught in this Atlanticists hate Europeanists and Europeanists hate Atlanticists and they fight with each other all the time. This is, this is childish. We should be beyond that. I don't think it's difficult to get beyond that. We need to think about how we get beyond that because the objective that I set up there is that we should in 20, 30 years time, whatever, I don't, I don't want to put a date on it. We should be in a situation where essentially the Europeans can take responsibility, primary responsibility for their own uh, uh, neighborhoods in association with the United States. Nobody's asking the United States to go out the door, but the rebalancing within NATO is the object of the exercise. Now, either we believe that this is a, wife, a worthwhile um, objective, or we think that this is a very dangerous objective and that we should Therefore, for the rest of time, and I put this to you because this is the question you have to answer, if you believe that Euro Europeans, European member states, for all eternity, should depend for their own collective defense and security on an external power over which we have very little control, which in a world of power transition is changing, just as the situation in Africa is changing, the situation in Russia is changing, uh, then if you believe that we have to be eternally dependent on the United States, then there's no point in really discussing this any further. If you believe, however, that we can arrive at a better balance in our relationship with the United States, and having reached a, a sort of two-pillar equivalence within the alliance, where Europeans are capable of taking greater responsibility and leadership in their neighborhood, then we have to discuss how we get there. This is the beginning of the discussion, not the end of the discussion. And when, and I finish on this, General Eisenhower in taking over command of Sacker in 1951 said, because the whole point of NATO, initially, the whole point, it was the Europeans were demanding of the Americans an entangling alliance which Washington had warned them again, against, again, again, right? It's the Europeans saying to Uncle Sam, please, we're in a mess. Would you temporarily backstop us while we get ourselves together so we can provide deterrence against the Soviet Union? And they eventually, after a lot of heart searching and a lot of 
banging of heads, they said yes. But it was always intended to be a temporary arrangement where, during which the Europeans got themselves together. And I think when Eisenhower said, in taking command of NATO in 1951, if NATO is still needed in 10 years' time, it will have failed in its mission, what he was effectively saying is the message that a lot of people are putting across still today in the United States. For heaven's sake, Europeans, take yourself seriously, stand up, grow up, become competent, and take responsibility for your neighborhood. Uh, I think we can do that. I think it would be infinitely in the interests of the Europeans, all of them, and it would be interest, infinitely in the interests of the Americans as well. So I leave you with that thought. This is the beginning of a conversation we have to try to see how we can get there, but we need to be clear about where it is we're trying to get. Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Jolien, and and uh, and, uh, and a warm welcome to everyone in the audience on my behalf as well. I am uh, Dr. Nikos Novaki, and it's a great pleasure for me to um, uh, to, to to be uh, uh, chairing this panel uh, to take some of the themes uh, that uh, Jolien laid out and perhaps unpack them and, and take them a little bit further. Um, so. European defense, um, is it time to aim high, as the title of, uh, of um, the, the, this uh, panel suggests? Are the uh, ideas that are currently being discussed in Brussels uh, uh, enough? Are they what we need? Or do we perhaps, as uh, Jolien uh, suggested and outlined, need to aim even a little bit higher? So sitting next to Jolien is uh, Dr. Alexander Vondra. He's the former Czech uh, Minister of Defense. He has also served as the Czech Deputy Prime Minister uh, for European Affairs and in uh, several other ministerial positions. He also participated in the Czechoslovakian <coughs> Democratic Opposition in, in, in the 1980s. Uh, sitting next to uh, Dr. Vondra is uh, Mr. Elmar Brock from, uh, uh, from the EPP Group in the European Parliament. Mr. Brock has the honor of uh, being the longest serving uh, MEP in the European Parliament. In fact, he has served uh, as MEP longer than I have lived. I was born uh, six years, two months, and 20 days after Mr. Brock was elected MEP. So, um, and then sitting next to me is uh, Professor Sven Biskop, uh, who is the director of uh, Europe in the World Program at the Egmont Institute and also a professor at the Ghent Institute for International Studies at uh, Ghent University. I'm conscious that we're slightly behind schedule at the moment, and uh, uh, Mr. Brock and uh, Professor Biskov have to leave us uh, slightly earlier. So I would kindly ask the speakers to kind of give about five minutes uh, talking points so we can then uh, have a bit of time to take uh, questions and answers afterwards. So without further ado, uh, I would uh, ask first, uh, uh, Elmar Brock uh, to give uh, his uh, his views on this subject uh, and uh, take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much uh, for the introductions and the paper, uh, which is quite helpful for our discussions. Uh, I does it work? Does it not work? No. And it does work. The microphone is on. Uh, is on. But this one is certainly Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, that we have to, can discuss this uh, interesting part of policy in Europe. For sure, this European defense policy will need a long time until it will become really <coughs> important. But it's always the question, is the glass half full, half empty? 
when I see the length of my participation in this European work, we could not think about defense policy as part of the European Union. Then we dreamed about it, the first proposal in the Maastricht Treaty, which was not very effective, but foreign policy became part of the European Constitution, if I might call uh, the treaties that way. And then we developed. And we got in the Treaty of Lisbon a lot of possibilities which are not yet used. And after the Brexit referendum, I must say, we achieved in 12 months more than we achieved in the 12 years before. Because certain instruments uh, became possible, especially the permanent structured cooperation. But the European Union has done something already in the Atlanta missions and other missions on the Balkans and so on. There is not nothing. But we are still in a situation, and I think we will be still a long time in this situation, which might become quite dangerous when they come to Washington, that for collective defense, NATO is indispensable. Uh, and I do not see at which time, hopefully 29, as you have proposed, uh, that we get this autonomy. We can do that, but uh, I have still my doubts whether we will achieve it. Uh, but permanent structured cooperation is of the utmost importance because it comes to a question which is one of the most difficult ones, how to use our money properly. You mentioned the figure 220 billion. The European Union member states spend nearly three times so much money for defense as, as Russia. We have more soldiers than the United States. The result is ridiculous. We have armies in the European Union where the overhead costs are 80%. If you go for the 2% NATO limit in some time, you can buy another military band for music. But with these structures, we will never get forward in the real strategic sense. Even in Germany, the overhead cost of the German army is 46%. A normal com company has to declare bankruptcy with such overhead costs. And here we have to look for the synergy effects. And uh, this is not just a question of political uh, command structures and all that and headquarters, which are quite important always uh, uh, not against NATO, not double structures, that's clear, I've not repeated, uh, but uh, when we are not better in hardware, we, we are not better in political influence. The European Union is the paymaster of the world. Uh, the European Union and its member states finance 60% of the developing aid of this world. They finance 70% of the humanitarian aid for the uh, Middle East. And they continue with these figures. We have an overall GNP which is higher than the United States, as you said, right? Uh, but uh, we are neither in Geneva nor in Sochi and the negotiation table. But they make plans that we pay us, us other, uh, afterwards the Marshall Plan. But we do not play a role. And this is only possible if you have not just a soft power, but also a hard power, not, not call carrots alone, they will not work. When you carrots should work, you need a stick. Mostly in, in order not to use the stick, but you need a stick. And here's the question, how we came forward with research, development, and procurement. There's no small budget for the first time in the EU budget for research. There, uh, Forum, uh, the defense ministers discuss one design project for development and then we have to come to the procurement part which is the most difficult ones because all the egos and lobbyists are against it. We see for example this wonderful plane A400M. It's called a European plane. No, it's eight times the national one. It does not fly since decades, 
And uh, after every country has put its special wishes into that plane, the plane was too heavy, so they had to construct new engines, which failed them too. And now the Germans buy uh, in America transport uh, planes, because the German planes we had until now, the Transalp, was rejected by African troops in Africa as un too unsafe. That's the reality of the world. And, uh, and the same thing is, and that is despite the good decisions that were taken in the Defense Union in uh, December, that they still do not, are not ready at home to the major st steps forward. If you want to have one design, we have synergy effects. We need a European procurement office, which not just coordinates, but also does it. The EDA, the European Defense Agency, has 400 people in a rotating system so that nobody can really accomplish something in three years here and there. That is the way of the member states to establish something, but it does not come a competitive thing. But at the same time, the Germans have decided now that the procurement office will enlarge by 2,500 people to 30,000 people. With that results that no Helicopter flies anymore in German army. There is a press here? <laughs> no, then I cannot tell my favorite joke. You cannot write it. Okay. okay. I have proposed to German Minister of Defense for the Peace Nobel Prize. Because if you are able that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the army cannot go into battle, what can you do more for peace? <laughs> 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 and therefore, we have to now come now to practical results, in detailed practical results. This proposal, for example, in, that is in this uh, agreement from uh, December, to start with, for example, with logistics. It's a very good idea. Do an example. Not every European country needs its own fleet for transport uh, planes. Put it together. I think the Netherlands are the uh, decisive country in that, should organize it. When someone needs such a uh, plane, it should be given from there. And that is few slow steps go forward in that question. And this is the crucial question. And this will bring us in a position that we have our own industri industrial background, that we become independent, that we become reliable, that we become interesting or a big partner in Washington and New York. This is not a question to destroy NATO. This is the way to bring NATO back in credibility. The Europeans, only if they act together, they have the critical mass to play a role and to be taken seriously. And uh, here I think uh, we have to develop uh, such a policy and I think we can more in detail when we come up in the further debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Brock. Uh, uh, the, the floor is now uh, passed to uh, Dr. Bondra. <coughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, when Mickey Zurinda called me a couple of weeks ago whether I would be able to come, I said, let's look, I have a free, uh, free Wednesday and can make it, uh, the trip here, but you will not like it because I will be very critical. And uh, to <laughs> you know me, you know. So, uh, look, uh, to put it simply, uh, my view is this. Uh, yes to EDP. So, European, we need to have a more elaborate, more active, uh, more uh, professional European defense policy. On the other hand, I have a problem with building this uh, European Defense Union, which uh, is a classical, you know, uh, putting the horse ahead of the car. Uh, we have a long experience with that in Europe. And I do have also a serious problem with uh, this buzzword uh, strategic autonomy. So uh, I read carefully uh, the paper of, of the professor. And I have to uh, tell you that I have uh, a lot of disagreements there. And it's nothing against the professor. He was just filling the mission 
his homework was to uh, to uh, to structuralize this uh, demand for uh, the strategic autonomy. I think that, and in fact, if you read this carefully, uh, the conclusion there is a proposal that you know if we are successful this EDU, then it's the end of NATO because NATO would be for nothing anymore. That's uh, and in fact, uh, you know, this quotation of, of Eisenhower, uh, in fact, uh, do you really believe that it was a, 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 a defeat of the West that NATO still existed in uh, 1959 and after? I don't think, you know, we in Eastern Europe, we were very happy that NATO was still here at the end of the Cold War. And I did my best to convince the Americans to continue with, uh, with the NATO commitment in the 90s and to enlarge NATO. And those American experts who are quoted uh, in, in the report, who advised us what we should do, those are exactly the same guys, you know, who were fighting with me because he, they did not want to enlarge NATO. They even did not want to continue with NATO. That's this uh, uh, part of the uh, real politics school in the US. So, you know, I'm not now eager to listen to them. You know, if I won the debate in the 90s to be defeated now here in, in Brussels by uh, the same uh, people. Why uh, there is a dangerous game with the strategic autonomy? And uh, why, you know, th there are five, uh, elements which uh, drives us into this debate. Rise of Russia, rise of China, uh, migration from the South, Brexit, and Trump. You repeated this, uh, and it's maybe five times in, in the report. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, go one after another. Uh, China, Russia, they are the nuclear powers, and I'm deeply convinced that it must be handled together with the United States. Uh, thanks for opening this debate about uh, the nuclear deterrence by the EU, but still, you know, to, to pass the responsibility to the agency, to the bureaucracy, that's... <laughs> Look, who is gonna to have a button? Sarkozy, should we trust him more than, than, uh, than Trump? You know, who... Uh, who uh, pay the money to uh, to uh, to uh, to Libya and then kill the leader? Should we trust him more? I, I would not. I trust more Trump. So, should we uh, pass the, uh, the the button to Angela Merkel? Should we do this to uh, Federica? Oh. <laughs> I would be afraid. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Although he's a realist, but not at all. Uh, so, look, uh, immigration, uh, it's not about the defense. It's about the home defense, not about the external defense. And most of all, it's about finding a common ground uh, for our deep uh, uh, philosophical disagreements. Some would say between East and West, some would say between the Western elites and the rest of Europe. So, uh, simply, uh, the problem is that if he take the responsibility for deterring Russia, first, you said that Putin plays uh, Tukididis with us and we are playing uh, um, uh, the human rights with him. You are identity. You are absolutely right. But my question is, are we ready to play the Tukididis? Because I do not believe that Putin is, uh, would start to play it according to different rules. And I agree with you that this is not about Putin, it's about Russia. He is a Tsar, and we are just lacking Metternich in the European politics. There is nowhere to be seen just to, uh, to discuss with Alexander the, the Tsar, to refuse the, what is against our interest, but somehow, you know, to, to engage in a conversation. I'm afraid that the US somehow are still able to do it, but I have a deep uh, mistrust about us and how we have handled Ukraine, which was a disaster and in fact inviting Putin to, uh, to annex the, uh, Crimea with our lack of competence in playing Tukididis. So uh, look, uh, those 
I would be able to, to talk uh, long about, about, about the problem, so the five minutes is, is passing. So uh, just, I would warn, because the United States, they have a strategic commitment in Europe, in Far East, regarding Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan ambivalency, and they have the commitment in the Middle East with regards to Israel. If we cut the strategic link by building a, uh, you know, if we have an alliance, there is not a real strategic autonomy. That's a contradiction in the adicto, and you know that, but it's not your mistake, it's a mistake uh, of us in our uh, security strategies because we have raised our ambitions beyond our capabilities uh, to play, play the games. And I agree with Elmar that we should do more in uh, having uh, a common defense market, uh, better equipped armies, but this is something different than to building the EDU or building the strategic autonomy. This is the prescription to cut the link with the United States, and thus we can be turned even against the US because they have those strategic commitments in the Far East and in Israel where we have even a problem to agree among ourselves. Israel is a classic example, you know. I would, as a Czech, I would fight for the Israelis, but I know many friends here who would fight rather for the other side. So it's a dangerous play and I'm warning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vondra. And uh, uh, thank you especially for outlining what, the, what might be described as the Atlanticist uh, uh, narrative, Atlanticist uh, option uh, into, into what uh, Jolyon had uh, outlined before. I now pass the floor to uh, Professor Biskop, um, who, like Jolyon, has uh, worked for many years in, in the area of EU defense. Uh, uh, Professor Biscop, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, all of us have little time, so much to read, uh, even on a relatively small field like CSDP. And, you know, even those of us who are supposed to spend our time doing just that, reading and then writing ourselves, we can't read it all. So we need rules. And good rules are simple rules. So one of my simple rules in order to choose what to read and what not is if it's written by Joel and Howard, I will read it. Um, and that turned out always to be a, a very a very useful um, rule. And I could be very brief and I'd say, I agree with Joel. You know, can't go wrong with that. I agree with, with Joel. But I, mean, I guess we want to hear a little bit uh, a little bit more, so let me do just that. Um, I'm surprised that so many people are disturbed by the notion of strategic autonomy, especially if you're a former minister, because if you don't have strategic autonomy, then what's the fun in being minister? That, that, then you're like the secretary general of the ministry, I would say. But but if you don't have autonomy, then, then yeah, what, what, what's there to, to decide on? Um, I, I think Jolyon put, put the case exactly right. We are, in a way, we're back to normal uh, in world politics. Unfortunately, back to normal means great power politics. Uh, in such an environment, you, you achieve yourself the scale of a great power and you count, or you undergo what the others decide for you. And what complicates it is that the great power that we're closest to, the US, has become very unpredictable. So on the one hand, yes, of course, the US is still strongly supporting us through NATO vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, but at the same time, they're also creating problems for us in other theaters that have nothing to do with NATO, Iran. such as Iran. And the more the Americans undermine the nuclear agreement with Iran, as even the UK has tried to point out to uh, Mr. Trump, they are going directly against the security interests of Europe. So saying, we'll be fine as long as we have NATO, is saying like, we'll be fine as long as the Maginot Line is being manned. The marginal line was not useless, it was actually useful, but the marginal line alone was not quite sufficient, as history has taught us. And, and it's the same with NATO. So strategic autonomy is, is I think, uh, imperative. And so I think this is a perspective from which we now have to use PESCO, the mechanism, the mechanism that, that we have. Here we have the chance to build, to acquire the strategic enable that would give us the autonomy and to allow us if necessary, to take care of our own problems in our own neighborhood. So we should use FESCO, PESCO to do the big strategic projects that, that 
would not otherwise get done because they, they require big critical mass of participating states and because they concern the, the common European interest and not just the national interest and because they require the countries who take part to get over their defense industrial um, protectionism. That's what we should need PESCO for. PESCO should become the single platform where Europeans do all collective capability development to meet their NATO requirements, their EU requirements, and their national requirements to create, as a notification document actually says, a single comprehensive full spectrum force package. That, that's what we need. But that will require sustained leadership, right? We, now we, we just have created the tool and, and we still have to use it, you know? All babies are beautiful when they are born. And, and to say the opposite would be malicious vis-a-vis -vis the mother. But then unfortunately some babies grow up and they look like me, but <laughs> we can still be hopeful and other babies will look up and, and, and look different. Um, so we now need sustained leadership from France and Germany who initiated the activation of PESCO and who then began to closely associate Italy and Spain. And I would say this uh, gang of four will hopefully have a more positive effect on history than that other gang of four. Um, and it's up to them to propose the strategic projects because only the big players can put the strategic projects on the table of PESCO, right? It's not going to be Belgium that say, let's develop a new fighter aircraft, let's, long, let's launch a satellite program. It have to be the big countries. If they don't bring the, the important projects to PESCO, if the, the big four only use them to do the marginal things, well, then the, other, the others will indeed see it as something margin, marginal. And if France and Germany do this, then, um, then, then, it, then it can work. And it will thus automatically, um, say, serve both, both the EU and NATO. And I agree with Jorgen in the long term, and I will end on that, um, if, if, if PESCO works, what you end up with is an ever more closely integrated set of forces that goes hand in hand, hopefully with an ever more integrated foreign policy. And in the end then, what would make sense is not to cut our tie with the Americans, but to reshape it and to say, we don't need an alliance with the US, between the US and all the individual European states, because the individual European states no longer are players. <coughs> we need a bilateral alliance between the US and the EU as such. And because one of my friends is in the room, Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Piscop, uh, on, on, uh, on for sharing your views. Um, I, I now open the floor for questions uh, because I'm uh, very conscious about the time, and I know that uh, both Mr. Brock and Professor Piscop uh, have to have to live a little bit uh, early. Um, so. If, if, if there are any questions in the audience specifically directed at Elmar Brock at this stage, I mean, please raise your hand, and I would urge you to go straight into the point and, and, and not give uh, statements. Any questions? Yes, lady in the uh, second row. Do we have a microphone? Please uh, make it brief. Yes, I'm Olga Grosmigo. Retired Director General of the European Parliament. I would like to ask you, since inside NATO there are more than difficulties among member states and maybe not friendly acts among member states, wouldn't you consider that it would be urgent for the European Union to have its own defense mechanism? Own? Defense <coughs> mechanism. Yeah, we need our own mechanisms, uh, but uh, it, it should be complementary to NATO. That's in fact true. For collective defense, we need NATO. And we have not, in this time, nuclear power, with the exception of a positive rubber. And uh, therefore, uh, I agree with Alexander, we should not go in that sense for strategic autonomy. We should play, become a role we should uh, become an equal partner so far as possible. It needs all a long time to develop that. But we have written in the EU treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon is written in the treaty. It's primary law. We have to do it in cooperation with NATO. 
and uh, therefore that is also legally binding for us, but it's political vice. But we see that there's a lot of things in Africa. Atlanta was there, Niger, Mali, the, the Balkans, and many other occasions where the Europeans have, have had to go in the neighborhood and where we are not conveyed any foreign American decision. As the Americans do missions without the Europeans, I think we must become able to do missions on our own. On our own. And here, therefore, we need structures. Therefore, it's important to have headquarters, have a com combination of our forces, not in that procurement question which I mentioned. Uh, we have to see uh, how we can come uh, that uh, multinational forces can cooperate. We have, have a lot of progress. If I see, for example, the cooperation of the German and Dutch army, this is a, uh, the, the Euro Corps, and many, many other examples. This has to be integrated in a way that's operational. Uh, and uh, when we talk then about uh, battle groups, we say we cannot have two battle groups. If it's a NATO mission, this battle group is a NATO mission. If it's a European question, the same two is a battle group for the European Union. We do not need two battle, different battle groups, uh, but we need our own infrastructure for that. And uh, that is also for NATO and the European Union one example. Uh, the Americans are calling us now for a, European, for a military Schengen. If I see now when we have to transport troops uh, to the Eastern Europe, uh, uh, to Eastern Europe, it's so complicated uh, because of controls which are done in the internal European borders that it becomes ridiculous. So also such structures have to be solved in order to make it workable. And uh, the, so it's important to have it for missions which we have to do alone. And it's important to have capacities to become a valuable partner. Here we have to come better. That is, 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 is the, the two points which we have to fulfill with that. And uh, we cannot rely that in the future everything the Americans will do so. We saw the reluctance of President Trump to make his commitment for Article 5 in the beginning until his Warsaw speech. Uh, I do not know whether in every European crisis, which is normally Article 5 uh, question, uh, for NATO, the senator of Minnesota or Wisconsin will say, okay, now we have to help because of the Washington Treaty, our European brothers. Uh, I think it's very helpful if we have our own, own capacity, which will encourage the Americans to cooperate with us. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is an, uh, quite an important question. And uh, we have to do it also to keep the European Union together. I believe a European Union, which in the middle term at least, does not fulfill this sentence. It says there should be no region and country in Europe which has a different level of security. Everyone should have the same level of security. And uh, this is one of the reasons to stay together. It's not just the economy to do that, but stay here together and uh, do that. And I think it's done by a party, by a NATO, but that in a rotation system, not to violating the, uh, until this stage, uh, the Russia NATO agreement uh, that uh, we sent uh, European troops also to Poland and the Baltic states at this moment has also a very positive impact on Europe. In this countries, people see they leave us not alone. So it has also such an impact. And if it's then done with more credibility, because there is more strength behind it, uh, then it will be very helpful for the European Union to develop, develop in that sense and to understand that this uh, community of fate can all uh, survive together in that question and just become an economic umbrella which will not last very long. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for your answer, Mr. Brock. Uh, I have another question uh, here in the first row, uh, Roland Freudenstein. Thanks very much, Nicholas. I'm, I'm Roland Freudenstein, Policy Director of the Martin Center. And my question goes directly to Jolyon Haworth, the author of the paper. If I understood you correctly, one of Europe's strategic goals should be to have an intelligent conversation with Russia. 
uh, or an intelligent strategy towards Russia. Now, if Europe had strategic autonomy, if, how would um, Europe's intelligence strategy towards Russia differ from the current one of the Atlantic Alliance, or would it be the same? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not absolutely convinced that the Atlantic Alliance as such has a strategy towards Russia. I mean, the uh, Americans have a relationship <coughs> with the Russians, which the Russians would like to be very special, but isn't. Um, and, and that has changed again from administration to administration. Basically, the Americans don't really care that much about Russia. They don't consider it that significant or that important, which irritates the hell out of the Russians. Uh, we have to have a relationship with Russia because they're our neighbor. So there is a division there between our interests and their interests. And, and the, 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 you know, when we say we are a community of interests, uh, that's true up to a point. But there comes a point where our interests and their interests are certainly not identical and are actually quite separate. They more or less subcontracted the East to us after the end of the Cold War. So it was Europe that was supposed to do the neighborhood, the you know, Eastern partnership. We were supposed to have a relationship with all of those countries on the front between Europe and Russia. And I think, and I agree here with uh, both uh, uh, Alexander Vondra and I think Alma make, make the same point. We messed it up. We did it very, very badly. Why did we do it badly? We did it badly because of well, all sorts of reasons why we messed up the, uh, the, the Eastern Partnership. But I think the most important was that we considered Russia completely uh, irrelevant to the, to, to, to the conversation. So we go directly into a conversation with, with Georgia, with Ukraine, with Azerbaijan and these other countries, some of which want to be members of the European Union, some of which have no intention of becoming members of the European Union. We treat them all the same. And we keep Russia outside the conversation. We should recognize this is a, you know, it's international relations 101 <laughs> that great powers have spheres of influence. Uh, as John Kerry said after the annexation of Crimea, Russia is behaving like a 19th century power. What's the matter with it? Well, there's nothing the matter with it. That's how great powers behave. This is what spheres of influence. So we have to. That's what I mean by having an intelligent conversation with Russia. We have many items on which we share interests with Russia: counterterrorism, Iran, uh, China, uh, getting the gas thing right. There are all sorts of things where we have lots and lots of identical interests with Russia. We can. We, we don't leverage those. We don't make maximum use of those in our conversation about stabilization of the entire region. I think we actually have a, a shared interest with Russia in stabilizing the whole Euro-Atlantic space. But for the moment, we've gone about it, I think, in a, an extremely uh, amateurish and, and counterproductive way, and we are, we are where we are now. Um, now, I wouldn't want to be in charge of Russia policy. I'm just an academic, so I throw ideas around. Uh, I recognize this is not easy, but uh, I think I've given you an element of response to your question. Sasha, do you agree? Of course not. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Horvath. Uh, at this stage, uh, we can take a couple of more questions from the floor. Um, you, you, sir, here. And uh, please keep it brief. <laughs> That's what journalists do. Uh, Brooke Stigner, Jane's Defense. Question to Mr. Brock. You said. Um, we need a European procurement agency. Um, procurement agency for whom? To purchase what and using whose money? Could you uh, expand on that, please? Thank you. I'll take a couple of more at this stage. There was a gentleman here in the back as well. Yes, you in the very back. Thank you, Pyramidal Toman, experts in geopolitics. Don't you think uh, the future lies more in coalition of the willing uh, mode? Uh, because uh, Europeans will never agree on the their same uh, security perception. And the world is fragmenting and the uh, EU is fragmenting as well. So maybe the only useful cooperation European level if to ease, provide more room of maneuver for national states when they can cooperate together on some specific zones, but on a uh, coalition of a willing approach, because otherwise it's, you, you, 
we are in an utopist approach. Thank you. One more question uh, here in the front. Hi, Ragnar Weiland. I'm a PhD uh, researcher at the ULB, the University of Deep Cell and the University of Warwick. Um, I have two brief questions that might be directed at. Very you. brief. Quite a few. Um, the first one um, on the, um, the, the different perspectives, depending on whether you are at the Polish border or a um, Portuguese beach, do you think that interest that, that these perspectives have converged a bit in recent years? Because it seems like certain foreign policy challenges have to you have Europeanized in ways, such as migration is not no longer just a southern problem; it's also north, north northern problem now. Putin is not just uh, or Russia is not just a Polish or Eastern European problem; it's also it's also embedded in this. Uh, do you see a, at least a certain con convergence? And the second question is: Do you feel that um, what, what, what is that might be for Mr. for Professor Holward um, the role of Brexit? Uh, is it with regards to the goals you set, do you think it's going to facilitate, undermine uh, the the ability to of the EU to reach these goals, or does it make no difference whatsoever? Thank you. Uh, I'll start uh, uh, these answers from uh, uh, Professor Biscop because he hasn't uh, had a chance to uh, uh, answer yet. Uh, if you could pick a question and uh, if you have any other comments that you would like to give, um, please feel free. Thank you, Niklas. I'll be the coalition of the willing one. I mean. To say that coalitions of the willing uh, would be sufficient is, is assuming that, that those individual states would actually have all the capabilities to, to undertake the operations that they want to undertake, which is no longer the case. I mean, even the two biggest military powers within uh, Europe, France and, and, and Britain, alone could not do Libya, right? Um, even France alone, France can project a brigade. Um, but only if, if Britain and Belgium and, and the Americans uh, help it transport the brigade. And compared to the other European states, deploying a brigade is a lot. At the world scale, deploying a brigade is nothing, right? So this is not to belittle the French, this is just to, to put things into perspective. So it, you have to go beyond coalitions of the willing. And in any case, any coalition that undertakes an operation, uh, in the end needs to link it to the other dimensions that are only available at the EU level in order to sustain the effort after its political dimension, the economic instruments, uh, and so on, uh, and so on and so forth. So to do PESCO and to integrate more and more our capabilities does not necessarily mean that everybody henceforth will take part in every operation, but it does mean that you need to create permanently multinationalized strategic enablers because without those, no coalition of the willing is still not going to go anywhere unless the US supports it. And the whole point is exactly that we can be less and less sure of that U.S. support. Thank you. Whose money? Yes, the money of the citizens. And in a moment we waste it. Well, that's too easy. No, I'm not finished. <laughs> but that is the real question. We spent 220, 230 billion of euros for defense, the member states of the European Union, with a ridiculous reserve. It's a waste of money to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Nobody rejects that point. It's a waste of money. Three times so much we rush it. And uh, more soldiers than the United States. It's a ridiculous result. And therefore we have to look for synergy effects that this taxpayer's <coughs> money can be used properly. That the citizens citizens get the result which protects them from pressure of external forces. That is all what Europe is about, to do that. And that for sure is difficult because there's that lobby group, there is that uh, uh, industrial company and the Germans are always afraid about uh, the ability of the French in industrial policy. The, all these questions are going around which we have to overcome because of the pressure of the time. And, uh, Therefore, I think uh, it's this question and combine it with this uh, uh, question of uh, coalition of the village. We will develop a defense fund, uh, which will be public-private partnership. And where in the, in the PESCO, the whole PESCO is coalition of the village. 27 countries have applied for that. <laughs> Astonishingly, I have not uh, uh, 
hope that so many countries will participate and others will come soon, yeah. uh, non-allied countries who have not yet dec decided. And if three or four or five of them want to make one project and uh, want to do it in one design in order to spare money and so on, find the synergy effects, then they should be helped by that, but they have spent for this project also their own money, but they do allow, uh, but it's better spent than before. And uh, therefore, I think I do not see the situation in the whole. That was the point. But the British stopped the European Union for years, since 2010, as PESCO was part of uh, our primary law to get PESCO because the British did not want to have cooperation of the villain. If we had not done that, it would have been anonymity. We have to overcome via coalitions of the willing, the problems of, uh, of, of veto rights, which has stopped everything, because always someone is against something. Uh, and therefore, we have to do that, but it's overall in, the, in that common interest, and it's not a two-class euro, because in every project, it will be different countries who will join that. And this means also, if we trust each other, that not every country has to do everything. A division of labor can be done. Not every country needs an air force or needs an, the submarines or whatever. So we can divide further the issue to spare money. And this is the long way because there is feelings against it. We are used to the whole technique, uh, what we have done. But the pressure of the costs and the pressure of the challenges from abroad will lead us to the situation. We have made these proposals in the European Parliament in the last seven years, every year, every time, every time. And suddenly, with Brexit, it became possible. Suddenly, with Brexit, it became possible because they could not stop it anymore. And uh, this, I think, is progress. I'm not sure that it will become a success story, but I very hope that it will become a success story in our interest. Thank you very much. At this stage, uh, uh, I would like all of you to, to, to um, give a, a set of applause to Professor Biskov and, and uh, Mr. Elmar Brock, who unfortunately have to leave slightly earlier. But we will uh, uh, stay here with uh, Dr. Vondra and uh, Professor Hover to uh, take uh, a few more questions. Professor Hobart, would you like to address at this stage like some of the questions that were, uh, there was a question about Brexit uh, that was not yet uh, answered. This one working, yeah, yeah. sure. Um, just very briefly on the coalitions of the willing, we, you know, we have objectively coalitions of the willing. Almost everything that NATO has done has been coalitions of the willing. Afghanistan was coalitions of the willing. Iraq was coalitions of the willing. Libya was coalitions of the willing. Uh, it's all around us. It's happening. That's the reality. Uh, and that will continue. What we're trying to establish here is something goes beyond that. So we either have to believe that we can get there or not. On Brexit, I think all I would say is the following. I mean, I, I, I do have a British passport, but I do not speak as a British citizen. Uh, I have other citizenships in the offing. Um, <laughs> and I prefer those. Um, but uh, it, it's, you know, very briefly, I guess, there's a part of me which thinks that it will be easier for the European Union with the Brits out not applying the break. Uh, and there's a part of me which recognizes it'll actually be much more serious and much more difficult because they're losing a, a serious partner. Um, if, as I believe is the case, the fundamental strategic challenge for Europe at the moment is this EU-NATO relationship, then Britain is going to have to play a role in that and it will be a complicated and ambivalent role because it, the Brits instinctively will not think the same way as many Europeans think about the way that relationship should go. However, I am certainly convinced as one who has spent much of the last 20 years teaching in the United States that Britain will realize, I think is already realizing, that it is no longer as interesting or as 
uh, important a partner for the United States as it was as a member in the European Union. I fear, uh, or maybe I even hope, whatever it's worth, that Britain may be condemned to spend 20 years or so of damp isolation in the middle of the North Sea, unloved by everybody, and will eventually decide who, it, who they are, who the Brits are. They've avoided that question since 1945, and we're now in a situation where they have to face up to that question. So I predict that in 20 years' time, Britain will reapply to become a member of the European Union and will become the most disciplined member of all and the most enthusiastic. <laughs> Dr. Bondra. Well, uh, I regret very much uh, Brexit. I think it's a very bad thing for us. I think, look, but let's keep it as a lesson that, you know, s sometimes we are too over ambitious and then we get the response. I was fighting with Elmar for Lisbon Treaty, you know, which was highly unpopular at home because in fact it gives the larger power to the biggers and the smaller are have to pay the price. But somehow we were able to convince despite a highly unpopular uh, agreement. The key argument behind this pushing ahead was to make Europe more global player, more competitive. And suddenly we have lost the United Kingdom, which has the nuclear deterrent, which has the Anglo-Saxonian way of doing the competitive business and, and the financial competitive business. And maybe we even lose English as a lingua franca. And if you have a common army, you need a common language. And I am really interested how long this Franco-German tandem would be ready to keep English as a common language. So, you know, let's take an, another example. It's EMAMU, which was a very ambitious project, project you know, uh, encompassing almost all Western Europe. Now, is there a convergence? No. There is a mess in the south. Look Italy, look Spain. So, you know, sometimes I would be careful. And what I have heard here many times that Brexit is in fact one of the driving force behind the building our European Defense Union. Uh, if this is done in a way that would make NATO weaker, I think that this is a really uh, uh, tragic consequences of our inability to learn the lesson. Well, we are weaker without the UK, so we make the weaker NATO. And look, PESCO. My country joined PESCO among those 27 to, yeah. But the logic behind it is not that we would be enthusiastic for uh, giving up a greater role to the great powers. Not at all. The logic behind that, because the Prime Minister did it almost secretly, there was no debate at home about this. I mean, Sobotka it was right before his departure. He did it as a lame duck Prime Minister. And they did it exactly because of one thing. Support for our membership in EMU is about 20%. 80% of the checks are against. So a similar situation to Tony Blair in 1998. You know, he wanted to uh, keep the European link. He knew that it's impossible to win in Britain the argument for British joining the EMU. So thus he created a San Malo track as a compensation. Remember, St. Malo logic was that, you know, if Britain is not able domestically uh, enter or integrate into the EMU, to keep the influence, let's build the common defense with France. But look, it was St. Malo and where they are now. 
We are out. At this stage, I, I would like to ask like one follow-up question from uh, um, Dr. Bondra, uh, because this uh, goes uh, to, the, to the core of what we're discussing here today. Uh, if not strategic autonomy, what, in your opinion, uh, should be the appropriate level of ambition for the European Union's defense efforts? Because uh, a lot of these same views and arguments uh, are, are also the ones that uh, Washington shares. Uh, but um, uh, it, it's not entirely clear, then, uh, what, what the uh, appropriate level of alternative ambition would be, especially like vis-a-vis -vis, uh, EU and NATO. So uh, if you have any views on this, it would be extremely interesting to hear. I think spend more on defense. If we want to have a more balanced relationship inside NATO, like EU and US, we have to spend more because they are spending 4% of GDP. We are, Germany spends just 1%. So if you pay full time less, you cannot have the same voice. Spend more, spend more, uh, spend smartly. So I'm in favor of div dividing labor, building the common defense market. Uh, we have to invest much more, for example, in R&D, but again, have to do it smartly, because if we do it badly, then we can, you know, uh, have not so much uh, additional value of uh, having more uh, R&D, but we can have a serious war with the United States, because, you know, is it, there is a dilemma, for example, in building a European defense fund. On one hand, we have, you know, we are building some rules of the free market to keep the competition. On the other hand, it's broadly subsidized, this business. Those are the public, not the private money. And it can lead us into a war, so do it smartly, because there are also the pitfalls, and we are not talking about this at all. But definitely to do more there. Uh, definitely to be more active, definitely to do the operations where we have the agreements. Atalanta was a great example in Somalia. Mali is a great example. But there are also the bad examples. Balkan, the, the German disagreements with France and, and UK even brought a fuel to building uh, the war momentum in Bosnia early in the 90s. Libya, you know, we were driven into the war by unilateral decisions of, of, of France and, and Britain. It was a stupid war when the United States had to come to the relief. So, you know, they are the both good and excellent examples, like Mali, but they are also the warning examples. Professor Howard had a, a brief comment at, at this stage. Uh, Professor, Professor Hobart, uh, would you like to uh, uh, give that comment at the moment? And I'll take some uh, more questions uh, afterwards. Um, actually, my, my comment was going to be a response to what was said about Tony Blair taking the defense route because he couldn't take the EMU route. I just don't think that that is true at all. Uh, the reason Britain went to San Malo was because the Ministry of Defense and the Foreign Office was getting the message from Washington that if the Europeans didn't get their act together, NATO was dead in the water. That was the reason why we went to San Malo, the British went to San Malo. Part of the problem on the European front, and it explains a lot about Brexit, is that nobody in the UK has ever attempted to explain to the British, no leader in the UK has ever attempted to explain to the British what the EU is about. The EU has always been a political football. It's been a scapegoat. It's been a negative. And there's no wonder that the media and the people have a very uh, negative view of what the EU is. It's a totally uninformed view of what the EU is. So I just wanted to come back on the Brexit thing because I do think that this is one area where the EU and, U and the UK both want to make this work. They are determined, whatever may happen in the trade front, the financial services front, the Northern Ireland front, uh, all of the fronts which are extremely complicated and which were simply kicked down the, the can down the road yesterday and will be kicked down the road at the council meeting at the weekend. We haven't resolved any of those problems and they remain very serious problems. But I think that on the defense front, there is a serious desire on both sides to come to some sensible arrangement. 
And that's why I said we're going to have to have new creative legal instruments which will allow us as Europeans to have a constructive relationship with the Brits hereafter. What I said earlier about the complexity of that relationship and the ambiguity of that relationship, and I can fully understand why most many European countries would not want to continue to have that relationship at all because Britain has played a, 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 a non-constructive role since the early days of CSDP. But nevertheless, it is a serious power. It is here in Europe. Uh, and um, I think we will find some way of um, constructed ambiguity which will allow us to reconstruct a more positive relationship on the defence front with the UK if it, if it leaves. You know, at the moment, nothing is resolved at all. Nothing. And I'm convinced that the British cabinet does not have a clue what it really wants to negotiate. You know, have our, Johnson says, sorry to diverge, but he says, you know, my policy on cake is pro having it and pro eating it. But the cabinet uh, doesn't have a clue which cake it's trying to bake. The uh, parliament is certainly not, doesn't have a consensus on whether to actually uh, go along with that cake. And within the country, there is no consensus at all on eating the cake. And the European Union is determined to ensure that Boris Johnson's policy on cake is totally half-baked. So the cake philosophy is dead, and we have to wait and see what happens down the line. Sorry for that diversion, but I couldn't help it. We're running a little bit out of time, um, so, so uh, I think if any one of you have any questions, I mean, perhaps you can come like after, after we finish this panel. Um, uh, I would now kindly ask the speakers to give, like, if you have any final kind of closing statements that you would like to give uh, before closing this panel. So, uh, Dr. Vonja, would you perhaps uh, like to go first? Yes, uh, to uh, allocate the resources, to find uh, the way how uh, to share pooled resources, how to uh, build the synergies, rather than building the new institutions, rather than uh, bringing new generals, you know, we need the soldiers, money and the guns. We need to have the people who are able to act in the terms of power and not uh, more cafeteria guys in the uh, pinky ties, you know, to discuss about superpower Europe. That's the prescription to hell. We need the people to be determined to act and we need the people who are able to communicate and to convince the people at home. That's the most important things. Otherwise, uh, the populist will defeat us totally. Uh, I will just repeat how I started, which is that this is the beginning of a conversation. We believe that the objective of a serious, competent, capable, adult, European Union in the sphere of defense is both desirable and achievable. If we set ourselves the objective of aiming for strategic autonomy, which I believe to be perfectly a reasonable objective for uh, a body like this European Union, then the rest of the conversation from here on for the next few years, or however long it takes, is about how we get there. And I hope that we've put some constructive ideas on the table today which can serve for the further conversation. Thank you very much. Just to sum up uh, very briefly uh, before I let you all you go, I think like what we have heard here this evening is a very interesting debate. And like Professor Hover just said, like this is the beginning of a discussion. I think uh, like this discussion has made clear that everyone here agrees that like we need to do something to improve uh, Europe's defense capabilities. Where there seems to be a difference is what the appropriate level of ambition should perhaps be uh, for the European Union, for NATO, and what that level of ambition uh, means in practice. On the one hand, you have the Europeanist uh, uh, view which suggests that this, this should be done through the European Union, through the European Union institutions. And on the other, the, uh, what could be called the Atlanticist narrative, which suggests like going through uh, uh, emphasizing the partnership with the United States, and NATO. Uh, but as uh, this is very much a discussion that is still ongoing, we hope uh, this event has provided you with some food for thought. 
we very much uh, uh, will, will continue this discussion with you, and uh, uh, we hope uh, you enjoyed this event. Thank you very much.